deserts and forests of Mongolia look completely untouched and far away from the destructive impact of mankind. What's more, the climate is hostile, with temperatures that are searing hot in the summer and freezing cold during the long winters. events have taken place which have forged the local inhabitants and created a race of survivors. The various different tribes that inhabit this immense country have reached the 21st century with the legacy of their ancestors intact. Ancestors who managed to adapt to the most extreme conditions of heat, cold and thirst. This legacy is both cultural and religious, and it is based on respect for nature. On the worship of heavenly powers, and on the memory of ancestors who under the command of Genghis Khan built the largest empire in history. During the 20th century, Mongolia made economic progress under the auspices of the Soviet Union. But these advances were accompanied by repression and the loss of freedom. With the end of communism came the economic crisis. But the Mongols recovered their own identity and their nomadic spirit was reborn. Even in the city of Ulaanbaatar, people still live in traditional gurs, houses that are ready to be picked up and carried somewhere else. <laughs> Mongolia lies in the landlocked heart of Asia. It covers a million and a half square kilometers and has just three million inhabitants. Most tribes earn a living from raising livestock, have all made long journeys and seasonal migration in search of pasture a way of life, and one which is protected by the spirits. The roads are lined with little stone altars, known as ovos, where people make offerings to ensure a successful journey's end. <laughs> Both a shaman and a lama are involved in building and blessing the ovo. It is the shaman's job to choose the location and place the offerings, which always include mutton, tobacco, money, and vodka. The second part of the ritual, the blessing, is the Lama's domain. The monotonous sound of his chants is identical to that of the first monks who arrived in the area, sometime around the 13th century. Instead of displacing shamanic beliefs, Buddhism merged with them to create a religious syncretism shared by almost the entire population. The ceremony ends when the whole congregation walks three times around the oval splashing water on the ground. From now on, both nomads and travelers have a new place where they can ask the spirits for protection and shelter. In Karakoram, the ancient capital of Mongolia, stands the monastery of Erdenizu. 
For decades, the essence of Buddhist tradition lay hidden behind these walls when the Mongolian authorities decreed that all religious practices were forbidden. During this time, the wooden temples and pagodas that stand inside the grounds were turned into a museum in which Buddhist imagery was pushed to one side, a reminder of what the communist government considered an obsolete and decadent ideology. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, changes came to Mongolia. From 1989 onwards, the monasteries started to reopen their doors, and the lamas took up their prayers and chants and ascetic lives once again. It was the rebirth of a religious practice that dates back to 1206, when Genghis Khan conquered Tibet and allowed the lamas to spread their beliefs throughout his conquered land. The monastery once housed over 1,000 monks. That was in the 1930s, when Stalinist repression wiped out thousands of temples and pagodas all over the country. Today, the population has returned to its traditional religious practices. Lamaist Buddhism has once again become one of the mainstays of Mongolian culture. More and more young men ask to be admitted to the monasteries to devote their life to meditation. <laughs> The traditional Mongol dwelling is called a gur, and it is perfectly suited to a society that refuses to relinquish its nomadic spirit. A gur is a circular room of varying diameter, the outer shell of which is made up of willow branches and lattices. In the center of the gur, Two poles hold up the roof and form the tono, or opening that serves as a chimney. All the roof segments are orange, a color associated with good luck as it represents the sun, whose heat is the most prized blessing the spirits can grant to the Mongols. The structure is covered by several layers of cloth and felt the number and thickness of which depend on the time of year. Marco Polo described these dwellings in his Book of Wonders. In some places, the materials used to build them are more modern. But in most rural communities, gurs are assembled with the same wooden fabric that was used in the 13th century, when the famous Venetian traveler first arrived at the court of the Great Khan. Last of all, the kitchen is installed, which also serves as heating, and the gur is covered with a white waterproof covering. It is the perfect home for a community of nomads. Easy to build, easy to transport, spacious and comfortable. With qualities like these, it's hardly surprising that gurs are to be seen in every Mongolian landscape. Living in a gur is one of many old customs that still remain among the Mongols. In a country where farming is impossible due to the climate, raising livestock is the main source of income and wealth, as it has been for centuries. 
Raising livestock requires pastures and water, and this means tribes have to travel around. This in turn leads to the need for warriors who are able to protect the population on its way through hostile territory. This nomadic society, with its mobile towns and tribal assemblies, lived its period of greatest splendor in the 12th century, when Mongol warriors conquered the world. It was the year 1206 when a prince named Temujin united all the tribes of the steppes and took the name Genghis Khan. In just a few years, his army had conquered an empire that stretched from Beijing and China to Eastern Europe and from the Siberian taiga to the coasts of the Indian Ocean. have been erected in numerous places to indicate the exact spot where Prince Temujin was born. Historians still cannot agree on his place of birth. This is perhaps fortunate. Centuries after the hordes from the steppes were wiped from the face of the earth, it is still possible to find places where the inhabitants feel they are directly descended from Genghis Khan. Today, in the 21st century, Mongolia is a long way from being the largest empire in the world. With the fall of the Soviet Union, the economy collapsed, and the population awoke from their dream of progress and civilization. When communism disappeared, the Russians went home, and unemployment and inflation shot up. Today, Ulaanbaatar is a city in decline, in which Gurs proliferate. Perhaps this is a way of expressing the Mongols' desire to return to the nomadic lifestyle of the steppes. This nomadic spirit can be seen in the caravans of camels that cross the desert, loaded with their owners' entire belongings. of the falconers who travel the snowy countryside in search of prey that can only be seen by eagles from the sky. In a country with no roads, in which every year, after the winter, paths have to be retraced and bridges rebuilt, this society has always retained its instinct for survival. After the failure of progress, the only future lies in a return to ancient traditions. that inseparable part of a Mongol's life. equine population can be counted in the millions. These tough little horses undergo a rigorous process of natural selection thanks to the climate. When the snow melts, thousands of foals will have died from hunger or cold. Only the strongest will have survived, and only they will reach maturity and produce their own offspring. Every spring, 
The livestock farmers round up the large herds of horses and put them in enclosures on farms in order to brand the new foals and train the best of them. After a few days, the horses have regained the energy they lost during the winter months and are ready to display their finest qualities. The expert eyes of the breeders first pick out the strongest male horses and catch them using the urga, a traditional long flexible lasso, which they handle with great skill. Then, the horse is ridden for the first time. The Mongolian horse eventually becomes a docile and reliable mount, but at first, it puts up quite a fight. Despite their small size, these are very strong horses used to living in the wild, and only the most skilled riders manage to control them. Horses are the main source of meat, milk, and leather for Mongolian herdsmen. But above all, here on the lonely steppes, they become inseparable companions, lovingly cared for at all times. the sky is the perfect spiritual antenna. The shaman blesses the trees that point towards the four cardinal points, and he turns back to the altar to be possessed by spirits. It is the belief of shamanism that everything that happens on earth is a result of the action of spirits. They therefore have to be invoked in order to obtain their favor. which is why unusual offerings are offered up to them. Such as this lamb, placed on the altar by the acolyte. It is the symbol of everything that was once alive, but is now dead. And it can come to life once more, thanks to heavenly intervention. Increases the rhythm of his chant and whirls around until he falls into a trance. The gates of heaven have opened, and the spirit, attracted by the chanting, has entered via the antennae of the tree's branches and it comes inside to take over the body of the shaman. It is time for petitions and blessings. The congregation moves towards the shaman, who has now become a superior being, and they ask him for his protection. 
With the arrival of spring, herdsmen and their families set off towards the high ground, where the pasture is good and water is plentiful. In these regions, where there are no roads and no villages to stop off at along the way, any journey, however short, involves three or four days of slow, exhausting travel. Normally, the men of the family will travel ahead first with the herds. When they find a good place to stop, the father returns to fetch his wife, small children, and all their belongings. The best place to spend the summer is near a lake, close to the eternally frozen mountain peaks, because although winter in Mongolia is cold, the summer is scorching hot, and in just a few days, the pasture lands will be withered by the sun. The new camp is quick to set up. With experience from having to repeat the same procedure four or five times a year, each member of the family knows exactly what their task is, and everything is ready in just a few hours. most sacred customs, hospitality. In a country where sleeping outdoors would mean freezing to death, and where snowstorms isolate villages for months on end, it is easy to understand why everyone is always made welcome in any home. <laughs> The neighbors, whose girl may be several days' journey away, have come to welcome the newcomers. <laughs> Seated around a tablecloth laden with sweetmeats and all kinds of dairy products, the hosts offer their guests a cup of tea while they chat about the latest events in the district. <laughs> Mongolian wrestling is a sport that requires strength, stamina, and cunning. It involves accepting a series of precepts that make it more a philosophy of life than a sport. The traditional outfit includes a hat, which stands for manliness, an open-fronted jacket, tight briefs, and boots. In summary, Mongolian wrestling consists of grabbing your adversary and knocking him over. With no other rules, from the moment the wrestlers grab each other until the final outcome, many hours may go by, during which the strongest wrestlers use their rival's weakness to defeat them. Wrestlers usually win. 
the most famous champions are absolutely colossal, and their fame can be compared to that of great boxers, professional cyclists, or footballers elsewhere in the world. Along with horse racing and archery, wrestling is one of Mongolia's three national sports, and it always raises a huge level of expectation. In Ulaanbaatar, the public fills up the stadiums to cheer on the great stars. But anywhere else in the country, a fight between two young wrestlers can still bring together dozens of fans. The fight is always held in front of the two rivals' trainers, who also act as referees. With each victory, the wrestler's prestige and rank increase, from falcon to elephant, lion or titan. The greatest glory goes to those who win the final match during the annual Naadam festival, held to commemorate the foundation of the Republic of Mongolia. At the end of the match, the loser has to pass underneath the arm of the winner as a sign of submission. Mongolia borders to the south with China, but the real frontier is marked by the Gobi, which in Mongolian means desert. It is a huge expanse of land with extreme temperatures in summer and winter, both day and night. But as in so many other places, adverse conditions present no obstacle and life manages to carry on. In spring and autumn, there is some rainfall and then the desert is covered by a blanket of grass, and thousands of animals gather here. With the collapse of the economy that followed the demise of the Soviet Union, livestock raising has become a growing business in this part of the country, and particularly the breeding of cashmere goats, whose wool is highly sought after worldwide. But this relative prosperity depends entirely on the Gobi's most highly prized asset, water. As the scarce pasture gradually disappears, the herds have to be moved further and further away, until with the arrival of summer, life revolves around the water wells. The first written reference to the desert is to be found in Marco Polo's Travels, or Book of Wonders, in which he situated some of the cities on the Silk Road in this region. In amazement, he described the long caravans formed by the animals that adapt most easily to life in the desert, camels. The ones in the Gobi Desert are Bactrian camels. They have long hair and stand up well to cold and thirst. They originally came from the Afghanistan region and are today an endangered species only to be found wild in certain parts of southern Mongolia. The Bactrian camel is extremely useful as a domesticated animal. Besides being an excellent pack animal for long journeys, its milk is widely appreciated and is used for making cheese and yogurt. Over the last few years, there has been a great increase in the demand for camel hair. Traders who used to travel to the Gobi farms for cashmere goat wool discovered they could make a cheaper, high-quality cloth out of Bactrian camel hair.
Wool has become the main source of income for the inhabitants of the Gobi Desert. And camel hair has turned out to be especially profitable, as these animals are fairly low maintenance. the offspring tethered, as this ensures that their mothers return every day to feed them. A couple of times a year, when the animal arrives to feed its young, she too is tethered and sheared. The nomads in the Gobi Desert are Kalkan Mongols. Today, they are Mongolia's largest nomadic population. They have lived in this inhospitable region since the days of Genghis Khan, and they consider themselves to be his direct descendants. very little human presence. The woods are untouched and still retain the mysterious feel and charm of a region on the outer confines of the world. In this region bordering on Siberia, there lives another nomadic ethnic group, the Tsatan reindeer herdsmen. The life of the Tsatan is a hard one. This region has the coldest recorded temperatures on the planet, so crop farming is impossible and pasture is scarce. The economy of this ethnic group is based exclusively on their reindeer, from which they obtain meat, milk, and skins. Their few household belongings are kept inside their tents, which are known as chums. These wooden structures covered with reindeer skin are set up and taken down again 10 or 12 times a year. Each time the reindeer have consumed all the local pasture or when snowfalls herald the winter. The Tsatan are an example of how to survive. As well as putting up with the adverse climate, they have always been treated with disdain by politicians. The communist authorities set up a kind of grotesque usufruct system, according to which the reindeer belonged to the Republic of Mongolia, which lent the animals to the Tsatan to be taken care of. This measure was clearly aimed at eliminating the tribe. However, in time, it was the communist regime that was to disappear, while the Tsatan continued to herd their reindeer in the snow and set off again on new journeys. Today, a number of families still continue to live as nomads in the forests of northern Mongolia in total harmony with nature a nature which forces them to fight for survival every single day. of the country, in the mountainous region bordering on Kazakhstan, live the free men of Altai, the Kazakhs, who love eagles and are highly skilled falconers. During the 19th century, the Kazakhs moved freely around Central Asia. 
But with the arrival of communism, Mongolia closed its borders. The Kazakhs remain shut up in this region, which over time, they have made their own. A falconer's most prized possession is his eagle. Taking care of these birds involves time and dedication and means strictly following customs that have been handed down through the generations. These breeders of birds of prey are highly superstitious and they believe that any kind of change may cause them to lose their falconry skills. This is why they make these hoods using the same materials and techniques as their ancestors. This is also the case with feeding. The wooden bowl where the meat is placed has belonged to this family for over a century. There is little left of the original, however, as over time, its pieces and decorations have been replaced. Just as in the rest of Mongolia, horses are the most important animal in the Kazakh herdsman's economy. During the summer, when there is plenty of pasture, the herds are kept stabled. And this is the best time to perform the tasks involved in breeding. The population of this region is widely dispersed. There are no roads, and the few villages that there are are badly supplied. Farms, therefore, have to be self-sufficient, and everything that they need in order to look after their animals and maintain their houses has to be made by hand. Forging metal is one of the most important jobs, particularly for making shoes for horses that travel through lands that are covered in ice for months on end. When the shoes are ready, they can be fitted onto the horse. A lifetime's experience with livestock makes this extremely precise task an easy one to perform. Although it causes no pain to the animal, any abrupt movement might cause a dangerous injury to the hoof. For hundreds of years, Central Asian livestock farmers have owned herds of yaks. Although the wild variety can weigh up to 1,000 kilos and stand up to two meters tall, these bovines are extremely docile in captivity and are highly resistant to the cold. In crop growing areas, they're used for working the fields. But for livestock farmers, they are the main source of milk, which they use to make high quality cheese and butter. The Kazakhs have managed to hold on to a great deal of their original culture, inherited from the Scythians who live near Persia. They still have their own language, they are Muslims, and their cuisine is mainly based on the meat and fat of mutton and lamb. Their herds are mainly composed of sheep. Besides meat and milk, they also provide another item that is essential to the lives of Kazakhs and Mongolians in general. The wool from the sheep is used to make the felt cloth that serves to cover the girds.
After the sheep have been sheared, the wool is soaked in freezing water and washed to remove any dirt. Hand weaving this cloth is another custom that has been handed down from father to son on the farms. <laughs> Once it is dried, the wool is spread out on these reed mats and slowly rolled up, while being dampened with warm water so as not to lose its density. The next step is to press the wool. Two or three people put their full weight on the roll, sometimes for hours at a time, until a thick layer of felt is obtained. It is very good quality and white in color, which is the color of traditional Mongolian dwellings. <laughs> Sheep's wool is also used to weave blankets and warm clothing. In these cold, isolated regions, cotton is an extremely expensive raw material. But thanks to the various different ways of treating wool, the right cloth is obtained for making all kinds of clothing, from the most hard-wearing to the most delicate. The falconers spend all their free time on their favorite hobby. The end of the spring is the time to look for golden eagle chicks, which are raised in the nests that can be found all over the region's rocky cliffs. The places where eagles breed are not easy to get to. But a good falconer knows that catching a fine specimen requires hard work and being constantly on the lookout. There's been no luck this time because the chicks are still too young. They won't survive outside the nest while they still have their fluffy white down. Dairy products are made towards the end of the spring. As soon as their young are born, plenty of milk can be taken from the sheep and yaks. The best way to preserve it for a long period of time is to turn it into a wide variety of cheeses and yogurts, which, once they are dry, can be put away to be eaten during the winter. According to tradition, Kazakh falconers have to wear a thick black coat and a brightly colored fur hat. The secret to keeping a golden eagle like this one is not to let them find out that they can live without help from a human. That's why they are fed the meat of dead animals and why they are kept in the dark under their hoods, because that is the only way that their wild instincts can be subdued. Astride his horse, with his eagle perched on his arm and dressed in his special outfit, the falconer looks like something out of a medieval tale. Yet, as we get closer to the various meeting places, we see that this tradition has been preserved intact all over the region. Each year, dozens of falconers, proudly bearing their favorite bird, gather to take part in tournaments. 
What is at stake here is their own honor and that of their ancestors, which in some cases dates back six or seven generations. During the first few days of the tournament, there is a lot of showing off. But all this is just practice, and the eagles are displayed performing controlled moves that involve no danger to the birds. At the top of the rocky crags, the hunters wait to release the prey which on this occasion are dead animals which will be dragged behind a horse to attract the predator's attention. The moment its owner removes its hood, the bird recovers the wild instinct that had lain muffled in the darkness. With its amazing eyesight, the eagle identifies its prey and dives towards it rapidly and accurately. Nightfall is the time to recall the legendary falconers who founded the various dynasties who have gathered here today in order to emulate them. During this yearly gathering, all kinds of traditional sports are practiced, such as Yulak Tartish, an individual or team competition that requires great skill and strength. The origins of this sport date back to the military training of the horsemen in Genghis Khan's army. Although the rules change in the various different regions of Asia where it's played, the game basically consists of carrying a lamb carcass to a certain place in the face of fierce opposition from rivals. It is time to compete. This time, the prey will not be on a string, and only the very best eagle will catch it first. The danger is also greater, as the fox or wolf might turn after being attacked and seriously injure the eagle. of the valley, the prey have no idea what is about to happen to them. By the time they see the predators, it will be too late to flee. At last, with stunning precision and strength, the predator hits the target to the amazement of the cheering onlookers. According to an ancient legend, a man would have to travel for a thousand years to see all the beauty that is contained in Mongolia. Perhaps that is the reason behind the nomadic spirit of the Mongols, to set off each day in search of somewhere new to settle, staying just long enough to prepare for another journey. Oh,